my grandfather, Hutch Mason, when they first started. He came to Mason over in 97, my father, grandfather. He watched Mason, my father watched Mason, I watched Mason. So, you know, I think it's a thing that if, you, if your father watches a football, I think you go to football. And it's like religion. You universally follow your father's footsteps. So when you're taken there as a child, you carry on watching the football. You know, I went to the ground in 1943 and watched the Kansas City Cup finals there and, and all the friendly games. And I uh, went there from 46 to 92 and two, I, 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 I'm watching Mason to 92. And I was at the last game on the ground, which wasn't played by Mason United, it was played by another uh, local side, and I was in the last ground on the ground in 1989, 16 United Football Club in chronological order. But it soon became pretty apparent that it's, it's impossible to do that without looking at Maidstone football from the roots up. Um, more than that though, when we first met the museum, they said to us, you, you shouldn't really uh, be thinking in terms of a chronology, which doesn't always necessarily work terribly well in a, in a museum. It's better to think in terms of themes. So we came up with uh, a concept for the exhibition which had a number of different themes to it uh, and the concept itself that, that we came up with was all to do with the fact that football very obviously has been bringing the whole community of Maidstone together uh, really since the 19th century and so we summed that up, that up in the title Maidstone United in Football. All these sort of people, I might pass them in the street and probably wouldn't even give them a second glance. Football brings people together. And I think that sums up what Maidstone's always been about. It's always been community-based, and it's always been the focal point of the town. So this is one of my favourite exhibits. It's the minute book of the original Maidstone Football Club uh, that preceded Maidstone United. Uh, the minute book was uh, set up at the time of the club's founding in 1891, and we uh, not only have that, but also the rules for members and uh, a later list for subscribers. Uh, wonderful original documents here. But they sell, tell a, a sad story because the town started up the club in 1891 in full hopes that this was going to go on to be uh, one of the national great clubs. But it was only four years uh, uh, until, just as the athletic ground was getting going, uh, the club folded, uh, really because things just hadn't been going well on the pitch and, and they couldn't make the, uh, the numbers add up. Uh, so, at the end of the day, um, the town's loss then was the town's gain when this gave the opportunity for... Uh, Maidstone in Victor to turn into Maidstone in United and give us the club we know and love today. As a schoolboy, probably around about 13, 12, 13, we used to go up to the athletic ground every Saturday and every Tuesday or Wednesday whenever they used to play under floodlights. Great atmosphere. And so we used to also go away to some of the occasional um, away games. But we spent most of our time up at the athletic ground. I think there were about four of us. Uh, four schoolboys from St Francis, we all went to the same school. We were always down the front of the stand shouting and cheering and we used to have at the time the old fashioned clackers that used to spin round. I think we became a bit, bit of a pain in the backside for some of the supporters because we were really noisy. Thank you. 
moment to have Maidstone United Football. Maidstone United, that's exactly why we're here. We're uniting Maidstone. And that's what we want to do today, and that's what we want to carry on doing. It is my belief that we must do everything we possibly can to introduce our uh, young to sport, particularly, and not necessarily football, but all sport. I've consulted about um, 450 people in the course of putting this project together, and you know the rule, if you mention one, you have to mention them all. So, these, all of you, you're all here because in some way or other you've contributed to what's going on upstairs. So let this event serve as a thank you to all of you. So Maidstone has been surprisingly innovative over the decades uh, and the innovators section of the, of the show is particularly interesting. Uh, and one of my favourites here is the one concerning uh, ladies football. You'll hear a lot of um, stories on the uh, broadcast media about how uh, women's football got off to an abortive start in the early 1920s and was really closed down by uh, an FA ban. Well, uh, I, I see things rather differently. I, I think what was happening back then was that there was one team, Dick Kerr's ladies, which was really a Harlem Globetrotters act of, of the day, rather than uh, any uh, serious organised football in the way that we understand it today. I think the real credit for getting women's football underway here and therefore in the world goes to people like these. These are the women of Maidstone ladies who got going in 1970. I'm uh, proud to say that I played a minor part in, uh, in getting this going. Um, but from uh, this team here playing in uh, green and white, uh, they developed uh, a, a club who uh, not only uh, produced a woman who played for 35 years for Maidstone uh, uh, football clubs, which was, was Pam Redshaw, but um, uh, also about eight different women's England internationals which is really a remarkable achievement just for this one town. Um, this, this club was so good that they even used to play a, a regular uh, in friendly against Spurs, and they gave as good as they got as well. And um, it was th them as well who produced Debbie Bampton, who went on to be an England legend. She played 95 times for her country, uh, was England captain, and she won the Women's FA Cup uh, five times. So uh, to think that she was the product of uh, our own women's football system is something the town can be very proud of. So what we have here is uh, a framed uh, collection of pictures of W.T. Beale, who was a Maidstone funeral director who uh, left behind the legacy in the form of a footballing dynasty. So he was the father of Bobby Beale, who went on to be goalkeeper of Manchester United and uh, the Football League. And uh, his son in turn was Wally Beale, who also um, was signed by Manchester United, although the uh, war rather got in the way of his career, but he later became um, a very significant fig figure in the Maidstone Sunday League. And you see him here uh, presenting a trophy to Alan Reynolds, who's still a very keen Maidstone fan today. Um, the, the, uh, there were other Beals who played for Maidstone as well, so uh, I think they have a claim to being the ultimate Maidstone footballing uh, family, although I'm sure others would uh, dispute that. Definitely being lucky enough to be there in the year of Dave Sadler, Mike Candy, Graham Gaston, Danny Wiltshire. They were really great times. It was 
pure sportsmanship. There wasn't a lot of professionalism in the background, or it didn't appear to be like that anyway to the supporter. So this is perhaps the highlight of the whole show. This is uh, the kit that Dave Sadler wore at the 1968 uh, European Cup final when Manchester United beat Benfica to lift the trophy. Uh, it's described here as Maidstone's proudest football moment, which uh, since Dave actually was born in Yolding is undoubtedly true. Uh, we not only have his kit here, but also um, a copy of the programme uh, and a, a picture of him lifting the trophy with his shirt off. Uh, and here we even have the actual medal that he won uh, on that day. Uh, Dave's been very supportive of the exhibition from the, uh, from the beginning, uh, albeit that he now lives right up in Manchester. And uh, I think that seeing this uh, exhibit here has given a lot of pride to the town and also, I'm glad to say, brought the name of David Sadler home to a whole new generation of football fans. When you thought, oh great, we're going to do something good, maybe ha having beaten Exeter, which I think we did at one time, and then the next round getting somebody maybe a little easier, you would think, and getting beaten. My Saturday nights always hinge on whether Maidstone United won or Maidstone United lost. If they lost, it was a bit quiet and miserable around my house. <laughs> Right, I'm here in the good times section, surrounded by happy memories, and there were very few uh, better memories than this one. The day that we went to Watford in the English First Division to play them in the third round of the FA Cup. This was Watford, who were owned by Elton John. They were managed by Graham Taylor, and their most famous player was the one you see in the middle here, taking on the Maidstone defence, that's John Barnes. We actually led them for a few minutes, even though we were a non-league club. Um, but although we lost 3-1, at the end of the game, they were so impressed by our attitude, the, uh, the Watford players, that they applauded us off the pitch, uh, which was magnificent and made us all very proud. Obviously, the Charlton game when the floodlights went out, we used Dickie Guy's air dryer to cool the coil down to get the lights back on. But that takes us to put the lights on too early. We never put the lights on that early before or again after. So in this case, we can see some evidence of one of the most extraordinary FA Cup encounters ever, uh, which also happens to feature Maidstone United. Uh, this was the very memorable uh, 1979 tie between uh, Charlton Athletic and Maidstone United um, in the third round of the FA Cup. Uh, and it all seemed to be going swimmingly until a few minutes from the end of the original game at the Valley when the two Charlton strikers decided to have a punch-up and were duly sent off, uh, which uh, might have been a great opportunity for us if the game hadn't been close to its end. Uh, it did mean they were both banned for the uh, return fixture uh, uh, during the week at the athletic ground when there was a huge crowd, uh, much, much bigger in fact than the declared figure. Uh, and uh, uh, sadly that day Maidstone couldn't quite pull it off, but um, this did leave us with one of the most wonderful memories uh, the sort of thing that football fans live for. I remember going with my mum and my dad and my brother and my sister when we played Charlton at home, uh, having got the 1-1 draw when Flanagan and Hales had the punch-up. I remember standing on the terrace and we were wall-to-wall -wall and we just could not move. I've never seen the ground anything like that. And I remember at half time trying to have a cigarette and my mother having to get my cigarettes out of my pocket because although allegedly it was a 10,600 crowd, I know that there was a lot of photocopy tickets that were going around. I know there was a lot of people that had gone over the wall and if that was a 10,600 crowd, I think there was probably near 16,000 in that ground at that time. One of the most remarkable games ever played at the Maidstone Athletic Ground didn't actually involve Maidstone United. It was in fact a 1925 amateur international between England and Ireland. And in front of a 10,000 crowd, uh, England rattled up a 4-1 lead by half time. Uh, but they were stunned with, when within three minutes, Harry McCracken uh, got a hat trick to make it 4-4. Luckily, uh, England had Claude Ashton in their ranks. He was uh, the man who'd recently captained the full senior team 
and uh, he got two more for England and, and that made the score 6-4. So this 10 goal thriller uh, was a treat for the 10,000 crowd and it's only a wonder that they never had uh, any more international football at the athletic ground. We're only uh, four months away from the start of the exhibition when I presented my recommendations for the content to the museum. And I immediately got a rather startling response, which was, there's too much. Uh, and uh, when you look around today, I, I think the museum were absolutely right. Um, even though we cut down more than half of the content I gathered, uh, you can see that it's a very full exhibition. Uh, it would have been a tragedy just to lose a lot of the material that I gathered and, and we couldn't include. So uh, I was left in the situation where we just had four months to put together uh, a record that included as much of that other material as possible. Um, this was the result, uh, a book of uh, the exhibition called Maidstone United in Football, uh, running to over 250 pages, which is... Um, uh, uh, packed with stories and pictures and, and really is a fairly comprehensive uh, record of what was in the show. Um, I dare say there was plenty more that could be included and so there's still a job to be done by future generations uh, filling in a, a lot of the history that just didn't make it into the book but I feel at least that we do have uh, some sort of legacy of the exhibition that people can hold on to and that will survive as a uh, memory of the day that they spent at the exhibition. So this is the bad times section, uh, which has a number of very sad stories in it concerning Maidstone footballers. And one of the saddest is this one, A Bridge Too Far, concerning uh, Bill Smallwood, who was Maidstone goalkeeper for some years before the Second World War. Um, he went off to become a glider pilot, landing troops at Arnhem, where sadly he was shot dead by a sniper and consequently never saw his son Richard, with whom his wife Nancy was then pregnant. Uh, Richard and Judy, his wife, did send me a whole bunch of uh, photographs and cuttings of uh, Bill Smallwood, which are included in the exhibition and, and uh, the, the exhibition book. Uh, and I met the two of them here, um, which was a, a very emotional occasion for all of us and really a tribute to the power of football to bring people together across the generations. Barry Fry, bless him, fantastic manager, brought players with him from Barnet who he thought were brilliant and they let us down. My, my abiding memory of Barry when I was kit man, we were in the very first game, we were at home when he took over and Barry liked to rant. Barry was terrible, he, he really ripped into the guys and unlike now where you get energy drinks and protein shakes, in those days it was a good old orange squash and cups of tea. And we made the tea in a little side room at London Road. And we put them in proper crockery. And Barry was going into one and he picked one of these cups up and he threw it across the room. And it smashed into a thousand pieces. And I thought, oh, I ain't having that. So the following home game, I went out and bought some polystyrene cups. And I filled them all up with tea and that. Sure enough, he came in at half-time. We were winning, but he was ranting. He was letting rip like nobody's business. And he picked this polystyrene cup up and he went to throw it and he just looked at it. And he turned around and he said, what the hell's this? I said, it's a polystyrene cup. You're not breaking another one of my china cups. With that, every single player fell about laughing. Even he had to start laughing. And we went out and won 3-4-0, I think, in the end. There was never a dull moment with Barry.
I honestly believe that we were let down with the athletic ground sale. I think that was that was what I would call corporate mismanagement. I mean, we were sold down the river, frankly. And I think more than the club, I think just the town was sold and the future of the town's sportsmen was sold down the river. And it just should have been handled better. I mean, we can complain about politicians, we can complain about owners of clubs till the cows come home. But collectively, none of them did a good job. Almost as soon as the exhibition opened, I was getting people asking me, what happens next? What happens after January the 18th, 2020, when the exhibition closes? And I must say I was nonplussed at the time. I didn't know the answer, and I think I still don't know. Uh, certainly, it would be wonderful if we could keep together the core of this exhibition so that people can see it uh, into the future. But to be able to do that practically is going to uh, demand money and effort and space that at the moment just aren't on the table. Um, but we have stimulated interest and that's the most important thing. We've had football historians coming from the far afield as Exeter and Reading and Watford to see what we've been doing here in Maidstone uh, to open up uh, the world of memorabilia to people as a means of learning about the past and being entertained by it. So I do hope that um, someone after me will step up to the plate uh, and, and take on this challenge of how do we uh, take the core of what we have here and bring this story of Maidstone home to people, not just for now, but into the future.